the Mexican cartels had a strategy that, no, nah, we, we don't want to sell to particularly shooty people near media capitals. <laughs> we'll sell to people who will overdose in quiet in just kind of take it towns in the Ohio river Valley that nobody's going to care much about. And so, I mean, nobody paid any attention to this increase in the white working class death rate until just fortuitously in 2015, Angus Deaton was awarded the Nobel prize in economics. And then a couple of weeks later, he and his wife published this important paper saying, you know, if you look at the CDC data, uh, life expectancy for white working class people without, you know, without college degrees has been dropping in the 21st century, and it's not supposed to happen. And it seems to be overdoses on painkillers. It seems to be suicide. It seems to be alcoholism. Just deaths of despair. Seven years into Obama. Yeah. Yeah, you know, fifteen years into the into when it started, around two thousand, when the the Sackler family, Purdue Pharmaceuticals, started their big push for uh, opioid prescriptions. But how would no one notice this? I wonder. Uh, you know, there's no organizations dedicated to to the welfare of white working class people. So the fact that they're dying in great numbers of novel causes, it basically relied on two academics and who said, wow, this is interesting. And one of them happened to win the Nobel Prize just before their paper came out. So people paid attention to their paper because, oh yeah, I heard about Angus Deaton and the Nobel, and the Nobel Prize last month. Well, that's kind of, if I can ask you to pause, it's a, I think you're right, but it's sort of interesting if you think about it. There are no organizations dedicated to the welfare of rural whites, yeah. but there are a lot of organizations dedicated to the welfare of a million other groups that are much smaller in number. Yeah. Um, so why aren't there any organizations dedicated uh, to that? You know, a few people have tried to set up organizations that speak for white people uh, the way that Al Sharpton speaks for black people and countless other organizations speak for Jewish people or Latinos and so forth and are highly respectable and are constantly quoted in the newspaper. You know, a, a bright, very gentlemanly fellow named Jared Taylor tried to do this for the last 30 years and, you know, and he's still banned on Twitter at this point. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, America has uh, a phobia about anybody speaking up for the emerging white minority. Um, everybody, you know, the conventional wisdom is that whites are rapidly being turned into a minority and that's a good thing. And, uh, but we're not going to treat, ever treat whites like the minority that they're becoming in, in multiple states across the country. We're going to treat them as the all-powerful, omnipotent legacy majority who can be blamed for everything from now on. But that's, I, I certainly uh, sure looks see that. that. Uh, well, I think that's absolutely right. But if their life expectancy is declining faster than anyone else is, and they are dying, then, I mean, it, it does seem... A little odd yeah. to lie about that. It, I mean, what's the yeah. intent there? It's it's a, nobody lied so much as they just wondered why are you interested in this? What kind of sinister reason do you have for worrying about the hundred million working class white people in the country who? are generating these not new problems and dropping dead from them and you know putting out the alarm about it is uh is just considered some sort of white supremacist white nationalist uh you know dog whistle that you know will lead to slavery and the holocaust and all sorts of imaginings um uh, and, you know, the, the other half of the white population wasn't suffering. Uh, you know, they, they weren't 
the, you know, the, the, the kind of people who don't have a bad back because they don't lift heavy things on the, on the job, you know, they're not hooked on oxycodone or, or when prescriptions got tightened up, they didn't go over to Mexican heroin and, and then to fentanyl and so forth. So, uh, you know, who cares? Uh, we're just talking about deplorables here. But, okay. I mean, I get, you know, everyone has preferences and, a lot of people um, in Washington, New York, and LA don't like the voting patterns of the population you're describing, but they are human beings and yeah. Americans. And if they're going extinct um, or they're dying in huge numbers in any case, uh, to ignore that or downplay it is, is evil, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, they, they to, to my view, they are our fellow American citizens, as are African Americans. Yes. And so the fact that Black Lives Matter in this ironic, complete self-destructiveness brought about just historic changes in the number of black lives dying in kind of the opposite of the, de the working, white working class deaths of exuberance, that you could see it in the Ferguson effect in 2015-16 and that now in the huge Floyd effect of the 2020s. I mean, we're talking uh, something like an incremental 15 to 20,000 more blacks have died in those in car crashes and murders than if the baseline of a few years ago had, had been maintained. And that's that's just enormous. That's, that's easily the black death rate death total in Vietnam, maybe Vietnam and Korea put together. Uh, and people should be talking about that too, because African-Americans are our fellow American citizens and we ought to be like keeping an eye on them and not refraining from noticing just because it's embarrassing, just because- Who's it elites, embarrassing to? Elites, the, conven the propounders of the conventional wisdom, uh, the respectable prestige press, academia, uh, the Democratic uh, Party, and so forth, that they, they promoted all of this stuff. Uh, they took Black Lives Matter at face value and did very little investigation. I mean, basically, you weren't anymore allowed to ask the question like, okay, Blacks men tend to get shot by the police about two to three times as often as white men per capita. That's, that's, that's a big difference, but it's nowhere near as big a difference as uh, blacks tend to get shot by each other about 10 times as much as whites get shot by each other. And probably blacks get shot by non-police whites, you know, dozens of times less often than they're shot by other blacks. Um, you know, black, young black men in this country have an enormous homicide problem, a gun homicide problem. Uh, I looked up for young, for males age 15 to 34, their death by gun homicide in 2022. And blacks, young black men died about 50, not 15, but 50 times more per capita by gunfire than young Asian men, 24 times more than young white men, and six times more than Hispanics. Uh, the Hisp Hispanics are fairly comparable in poverty rate and education and so forth. And but they don't have anywhere near the kind of uh, gun problem that uh, African Americans have developed. And I think, but is anybody out there asking young African Americans and telling them, you know, you, if you guys could not get your homicide rate down to the Hispanic level, if you could get it down halfway from where it is now to the Hispanic level, this country would be so much better off and race relations would be so much better. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. We hope you'll subscribe to it. And by the way, you can hit the little bell on there 
and get notifications every time we produce a video. We hope you'll do that also.